Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for coming to my talk. And thank you very much to the organizers um, of the conference for having me, inviting me to this very nice conference. Um, what I want to do today is uh, to tell you how functional programming and the research-based approach is really the right way to go about developing blockchains and uh, smart contract applications on top of them. And along the way, I will tell you what we are busy with uh, in the Plutus team at IFK, which I'm leading. All right, so blockchains. Let's talk about blockchains a little bit, not the hype in the uh, mainstream media, but wh what's technically, what are the challenges here? So let's suppose we have three parties, uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, as usual, and they want to exchange some funds and record who's got what and what happened um, on uh, a cryptographic ledger. Well, then they send transactions to this ledger. For example, Alice wants to uh, move some funds to Bob or Bob to Charlie. And what happens on this ledger isn't that we update anything, but we only add information. And we do that in a way using cryptographic techniques that you can't change what's on the ledger um, after the fact anymore. So what we actually get is an immutable, verifiable log data structure. That's what it boils down to. Now, if you've got such a data structure, maybe we can do something more interesting with it than just record monetary values on it. Well, for starters, we could, for example, associate some metadata with those transactions, like why did we make this transaction? Or we can do something even more exciting and actually only use the monetary aspect of the ledger as a means to operate it and store completely different data on it. So let's take the example of an uh, online multiplayer game. These days, the way they are monetized is not by selling the game, but by having in-game artifacts which you get for specific achievements, and then the users can trade them as well. Right? And so, for example, let's suppose we have some such game and, uh, which Alice made, and, and Bob really does something awesome and gets a fancy hat, yay! And then maybe actually he doesn't like that fancy hat so much, but Charlie likes it much more and they want to trade it. And that now it starts to become a little bit interesting because in this trade, to make sure it is valid, we really have to check that Bob completed this achievement. So now we have some additional rules which tell us which kind of transactions, which kind of information can we put on this ledger. We call this the validation rules. So we want additional custom data-specific, application-specific validation rules. So that's interesting because, okay, some additional code. But that's not enough because if in this example, we also have to connect this entire cryptographic ledger to the actual game, to the client operated by each individual gamer and uh, the game servers which uh, determine the achievements and so on. So we also have some independent of the actual ledger code we have to write and where we have to compose things. So now we have code on the chain for validation, we have code off the chain to do everything else. We really start to need a programming language for that. Now maybe you are thinking, ah, I'm really not into online games and if that's the only thing you can do with this, not really that interesting. So we can look at what the European Union actually has a commission digital single market for all kinds of digital infrastructure, including blockchain, what they think can be done with this kind of technology. And they come up with all kinds of things, identity management, um, general all kinds of asset registries, um, even tax offices can, they propose, use this type of technology. So I use this game thing as a funny example, but there are all kinds of similarly structured applications which fit the same patterns. Okay, so we established, got to need a programming language. 
and hmm, will we need it in two different places. We have these validation scripts which run on the server which, put, which uh, maintains the cryptographic ledger, and then we have this other code on clients, on the individual users associated with the wallets and uh, any other client code. And, well, we actually have got many of everything, um, and the, server, the servers need to get access to this on-chain validation code, so this has to be somehow stored on the blockchain as well. And then we have many servers, we have many clients, so actually we are in a, in a large-scale distributed concurrent system situation. Which brings one more interesting point into play, namely, if there are many services, there's not only one server which maintains this data structure, but there are actually many, how do we know they collaborate properly? How do we know nobody's going to cheat? And this is what's called the consensus problem. So we need some sort of distributed algorithm which achieves consensus between these servers in a way that third parties actually believe everybody played by the rules. In, in particular, everybody actually follows the correct validation rules. And there are basically three ways of doing that, which we know about today, these days. So the classic one you may have heard about, which is used by Bitcoin, is proof of work. But the work, which is the proof for consensus, is completely meaningless work. What I mean by this, each server solves lots of crypto, hard cryptographic puzzles, basically guessing numbers, computing hashes, and wanting hash of a particular structure, which contributes nothing to the whole problem except that it's difficult and uses a lot of energy. So this is what Bitcoin uses, and these days Bitcoin consumes something like the energy of a small country. So maybe in the day and age of global warming, not such a brilliant plan. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is what's called proof of stake. And in proof of stake, it's the investment of the various users of the system into the system, which is used to determine who and when these blocks are computed and to make sure that the, everybody follows the rules of the system in particular these on-chain validation rules. That's much more promising because now, in terms of energy consumption, because now you can actually run um, a blockchain node on, on a small embedded device, and you don't need huge GPU farms next to power stations. And then the third thing, for completeness sake, is we can have something um, which is just allowing a few players to play. It's not an open system. It's a closed system where you have to get authority to add a server to this. So this is a little bit as the comparison between the open public internet and uh, enterprise um, intranet. So the permission setup is like an intranet blockchain. And the other two, proof of work and proof of stake, this is like the public internet where everybody can participate. So that's what I'm interested here in the public case. It's also a difficult case. Now, this is actually still, from a cryptographic point of view, it's still an active research area. You can still get papers accepted at high-end crypto conferences and journals by coming up with new good consensus algorithms in this space. And um, unfortunately, it also is really important to get this right because these blockchains, they capture a lot of value. So at the moment, I think Bitcoin's capitalization is about 150 billion. Um, Cardano, the blockchain I'm going to talk about, is about uh, 1 billion um, US dollar or euro, I forgot. And um, so it's really attractive to try to hack these systems, obviously. So we have to get it right. And then you may, people, often ask, well, can't we get rid of these cryptocurrencies? Can't we just have our blockchain as a data structure and not worry with all this speculation? Well, unfortunately, we can't do that because for a public blockchain, who is going to run this thing? It's run by, in Bitcoin terminology, the miners or in the proof-of-stake systems, the slot leaders, 
because they are actually paid in cryptocurrency to run the servers. So the system, the people who maintain the system are paid through the cryptocurrency. So if there's no cryptocurrency, nobody is going to operate the system. So the two, you can't separate them in a public blockchain. All right. So I don't want to spend too much time on consensus algorithms, but what's really super important, this stuff has to work correctly. Otherwise, it'll be hacked. So, what have we seen so far? We want these immutable verifiable log data structures. We need programming language for on-chain validation, off-chain additional code. We really want this proof-of-stake system because Earth, and, um, and we really need to get it right because these systems are under attack from sophisticated parties. Okay, so we better have, last point, better use a kind of proper foundational research-based approach to developing these systems. So, what does that mean? For me, that means we are going to use functional programming and we are going to use type systems to kind of structure this, the development of the blockchain itself and also those smart contracts. So, why is that good? I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here because it's a functional programming conference, but what really is the key point? And the key point is really one thing that we are talking about functions, and we are not talking about any old function, because C has functions too, right? Remember? But we are talking about what's a function in the mathematical sense, or what I want to call a pure function to distinguish it. So you have a mapping from inputs to outputs, and if you apply this pure function to the same inputs twice, you get the same outputs twice. Every, and if you do this 50 times, always same inputs, same outputs. So there's no global state, no side effects, no nonsense. That, if we stick to that, then we get a lot of benefits. If we combine it with types, then we also get more assurance about actually using interfaces in the right way. And overall, the upshot is that we can use local reasoning. We can think about the, a piece of code, a function, without considering all the rest of our code base. And this is very important if we want to do high assurance code development, where our code isn't going to get hacked at the end of the day. And we can use a type-directed design approach. And also very important in this context, we can use verification techniques with formal verification and advanced testing techniques to make sure the algorithms are correct and the implementation of our impl algorithms is correct. So, at the end of the day, why do we do use functional programming? In order to be able to better understand what our code is really doing and avoid exploits in this context where it's very attractive to attack the system. Now, there are actually a few blockchains which go in this direction, and I don't want to go through all the details, I just want to give you an overview. Um, so, what are they use in terms of programming language and proving infrastructure for the implementation. Um, a variety of functional languages, ex with the exception of Xila, which is implemented in C++, the blockchain itself, but the smart contract layer uses OCaml. And except Eternity, they all use various theme provers, um, Acta, Cog, Isabel, in order to um, verify particular aspects of the system, of the protocols, of the implementation, and so on and a smart contract languages, so to code these custom validation rules, they also use various forms of functional programming languages. And then there are also some blockchain agnostic, higher level domain specific languages, which are also based on like modern programming language research, I would say. All right, so what I want to concentrate on is Cardano. Cardano is developed by IOHK, it's the engineering company behind it. And uh, it's a proof-of-stake system. We actually have um, a blockchain node running on a RockPi. That's a small um, embedded de uh, device. Um, that's all the energy you need uh, to run this thing. Um, the development uses functional programming, especially Haskell, a lot, and um, also formal methods in a variety of ways, which I'll explain in a second. And um, it is a very research-driven effort. In fact, there's 
the first step to was to invent a new consensus algorithm. And for that, ISK has been funding the blockchain lab at the University of Edinburgh, headed by Arklios Kiayas. And also in the, on the programming side, in Plutus team, we are working together with Phil Wadler, who is also in Edinburgh, and um, one of the Plutus uh, contributors. So, how does this research thing? So, how do we get from, from a research paper from the cryptographers to actual code we can ship? Because that's not so easy. I mean, if you read a research paper, then that's a far cry from actually having something you can use on a computer. So, we use a kind of three-step three method. We have the research, we formalize what's happening in these papers using formal methods, and then we turn it into a function program. So what does that mean in, in concrete terms? Well, scientists write papers, publish them at conferences and journals, like the Ouroboros, this is the consensus protocol of Cardano, and other papers. And then um, we take those papers and we write a semi-formal specification, something that looks like that. It's also LaTeX, but it's basically just um, using set theory. So it's mathematical, but fairly simple math. And it's quite close to functional programs, already kind of type signatures and equalities. So if you squint a bit, little bit, you could think it's a Haskell program. And that's what we are doing. That's step number two. We take this and we translate it into Haskell in a way that for somebody who knows Haskell, it's actually quite clear. So yeah, we've used the pair in the later description and the record with names in the actual code, but it's pretty clear if you look at it, the code is implementing what's, what's on the, in the paper. So we do that also for all the functions which are used in that, uh, in that specification and translate them in a corresponding manner into Haskell code, which is structurally really the same as the formal specification. And then we've got an executable prototype. It's not going to be particularly fast or efficient, but it's going to do the right thing. And we know it's going to do the right thing because it really mirrors this specification very closely. And then what we are, going, what we are doing, we write a second Haskell program. Now this time, we actually um, address all the engineering requirements, we use proper database, networking libraries, all the stuff you have to do to get an actual good product. And we use that production implementation in Haskell together with the model which we developed from the specification in Haskell and we use property-based testing in order to make sure that the two tools do the same. For the blockchain implementation, this for example means we generate chains, and then we run these two implementations on the cha same chain, and they should end up with the same result distribution of funds and what's on the ledger and so on, if they are really doing the same thing. That gives us a very high assurance that our implementation actually implements what, what was in the original paper. All right, so that's the um, kind of path from research to actual code. So. Let's get to the actual smart contracts. And in order to see how we can get to a functional way of writing those, um, we'll have to look at the ledger again. This was the example I had before, this ledger with Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and two transactions. But you're actually not, as an end user, you're not interested in that whole history. What you're interested in is who's got how many ADA. ADA is the currency of the Cardano blockchain. So we call this an account-based model of a uh, ledger. Why? Because it's like your bank, right? You're interested in each account and what's the funds on the accounts. Now, there's an alternative which was actually introduced by Bitcoin, and that's to look at paper more like paper notes. So everybody's got some funds in terms of ADA, but if Alice wants to pay those 42 to Bob, then she has to split the 100 ADA she's got and get some change back, right? So she, she splits that and pays those, a part of those funds to Bob. And now in, for Bob to do his transaction to Charlie of 50, he has to take what he got from Alice, combine 
that is what he's got already, and then make the payment and also get some change. So now we get kind of a graph-like structure of how the history of the ledger um, evolves. And what does it mean to who has how many funds? Well, in order to extend such a line, we call this an output, you have to have a cryptographic proof that you are the owner, that you are able to spend that. So ownership of funds means cryptographic proof of being able to spend those funds. And this structure, because it has these dangling black lines, which are called the output, and they're not spent yet, is called the unspent transaction output representation of a ledger. So these are the two alternatives. Now, let's com com compare them from a computational point of view. Now, if you think about this bank-style account example, then really this is quite an imperative object-oriented structure. And maybe in your first year at uni, object-oriented programming, they like to use bank accounts as an example, right, for object-oriented programming. So the objects are the accounts, and they send messages to each other, transferring stuff. All right, so on the other side, this UTXO graph is really, it's a data flow graph. Right? So this is like the incarnation of a functional data structure. Everything, all the flow of information is fully explicit. There are no side effects or in-place updates, anything like that. Now, in the account example, though, because of this imperative object-oriented structure, it's really multiple shared state is at the core of this representation. Now, remember, with the blockchain, we have many servers, many clients, so really, we have a distributed concurrent system, and then we are talking about mutable state. So you should know when somebody mentions concurrency, distribution, mutable state in one sentence, run away. It's not going to end well. Well, we know it often doesn't end well because of all the, I'm sure, headlines you've also read about people hacking, for especially Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum blockchain, and um, getting away with a lot of money. So in fact, if we look at smart contracts in this context, then it's Bitcoin representation uses this UTXO model, this function model. But Bitcoin has very limited um, co contract capabilities. As Ethereum has been especially built as a successor or an, a further development, I should say, with really a lot of programmability built in. So in Bitcoin, it's really minimal, it's a functional approach. And in Ethereum, we have this object-oriented, account-based structure, and we got a lot of programmability, and we can lose a lot of money really quickly. So can we kind of get a balance? Can we get a functional approach, but still have the expressiveness of what we have in Ethereum? And some blockchains, they try to restrict what you can do, like in this account-based model, using actor-style approach. Um, it's one way. So we've done something different. We've taken this UTXO structure and spent transaction output structure and made it more expressive to stay in a purely functional model. So what do I mean by that? For that, we have to look a bit more into how that structure works. So if we've got one transaction, then a transaction has one or more inputs in red and one or more outputs in black. And if I want to spend the output of a transaction, meaning I want to add another transaction to it, connecting the two, then I have to fulfill certain conditions with this second transaction. What are these conditions? Well, at each output, so the black arc, there's two pieces of information. There's the cryptocurrency spent, or additional information, if you like, added to that, and um, a validator. That's a piece of code whose job is to check that any connection we make is actually good, follows the rules of the game. And the input, the red bit, which wants to spend that output, it also has a piece of code called the redeemer or in Bitcoin, the witness. And then in order to determine whether we can make this connection, we do one very simple computation. 
we take the validator, which is a function, apply it to the redeemer, and evaluate that. And if it's that result of that evaluation is true, good to go. We can make the connection. Otherwise, it's rejected, the transaction is thrown away. So how could we extend this to, to improve uh, expressiveness? Well, we can add some additional data on which this valid data can context information, state information about our smart contract to the outputs, and then also take the entire transaction which is being validated, the information of that, and pass all that as well to the validator. So now the validator gets a lot of more con context information. It can make a more global decision than just looking at this redeemer, which is a very local view on the blockchain. And then we do the same evaluation. Now, this seems like a quite modest extension. In particular, it keeps this data flow structure 100% intact. But it's actually quite powerful. We call this the extended UTXO model. And it allows us to model all these computations which you can express in, on the Ethereum blockchain, um, including computations which span multiple transactions. So where we have validation, which has to span an entire chain of transaction, and certain invariants have to be um, kept throughout that entire chain. And it is still a purely functional model. There's no mutable state. There's no updates of any sort. So that's quite beneficial. And because it's a simple system, we've actually got a, a formalization of it in ACTA, which is a dependently typed programming language slash theorem prover uh, in collaboration with the University of Utrecht. And um, we have an immediate benefit apart from, yeah, we're using functional programming now, there's actually an immediate benefit to this purity if we compare it with the theorem. So what's that? So all this code, the validator, the redeemer, all this stuff is, is um, in a functional language, which I'll come to in a, in a second. So overall, this is a purely functional computation. The validator is a pure function. What does that mean? What did we say? So for pure function, if I apply it to the same values twice, I always get the same result. But not only that, I get the same result, but the execution also takes the same amount of time. And that's important because on a public blockchain, you pay for execution of all validation code. You have to pay for it. It's part of the economic model which makes the chain work. So, which means running this twice, or four or five or six times, you always consume the same execution cost. You may think, yeah, of course, that's what you would expect. Well, not in a, in a uh, system which is based on, on non-pure functions and global state, which changes uh, all the time. So if we look at Ethereum and we go on Stack Exchange, we find questions like this. So I, I, I called my Ethereum contract and you have to give it some, it's called gas, the costs which you allow the thing to spend. And it ran out of gas, so it ran out of money. And can I get it back? And the answer is no, it's immutable blockchain. You don't get anything back or get to change anything in the history. But you can try again, give it more money, and maybe then it works. So we completely get rid of this problem because we can perfectly predict because execution always takes the same time, uh, because it's a pure, pure function, um, and not have this problem at all. So having this discipline of sticking to pure functions, you get immediate benefits. So what's this code on the blockchain? Um, as I said, the code, the validation rules you store on the blockchain, they're immutable. You can't change them anymore. Once that code is on the chain, it's on the chain. No patching, no updating. If it's wrong, bad luck, right? So, and this code may protect, the validators protect spending. It may protect a lot of money. So this whole move fast and break thing approach is not really a good idea. So what we are using as the uh, representation of code there is something where we can use formal methods on quite easily. It's not some bytecode, which is what's typically used, but it's a, it's a lambda calculus. It's 
uh, a variation of a lambda calculus. And we don't use a complicated virtual machine to uh, execute it because those usually also have bugs. I mean, when did you get the last update to your JavaScript engine? Probably yesterday. Um, but we use an abstract machine interpreter, which is again very close to the specification. And what I mean by this, I'll show you in a second. And what we are using is something called System F Omega, which is System F is a typed lambda calculus, also using GFC as the intermediate language. And the Omega bit means more type stuff. But it's an old system. It's very well understood. Um, we know how it behaves, what it does, what its semantics is. But this is, this is the entire set of rules you need to execute the system F code. I don't expect you to read this. The point is, it fits on a slide. And so we can, again, write a Haskell program which very closely mirrors that. It has one line for each line here in the execution and has this thing as a comment on top. So you can really compare it's doing the same thing. But this is not good enough. So we, again, wrote an actor formalization of the whole thing and the entire meta theory and the type system and the type inference. And we are using that to test the Haskell implementation. Uh, against. So, again, to make sure we really get it right. And we've got a paper about this too, in last week in Porto, MPC. All right, so how do we get to this Plutus core? Because system F omega tops for something you can, can formalize, but you don't really want to program it. It's like programming assembly code. You don't want to write your programs in uh, lambda calculus. So, we need a programming language. Now, Solidity, this is the programming language of Ethereum, and it's a weird cross between JavaScript, Python, and some other things, which are unclear. And that doesn't quite fit our approach, I would say. So we can't do that. So what people then usually do is, let's invent a new programming language. <laughs> and that's fun. I'm a programming language researcher by training. I like to invent programming language. So it's one every day. But it's actually quite a lot of work, not inventing the programming language, but everything else. You have to write a compiler, you need highlighting in editors, you need a, a packaging system, you need libraries, you need documentation, you need a community of people who actually use the thing. And doing all this is a complicated, expensive process and usually it doesn't work out because nobody is using the language. So, yeah, fun, but maybe not the best approach. So we thought, there are already many programming languages, and some of them may fit the bill. So, a bit biased, we thought, well, what about Haskell? I mean, it ticks all the boxes, expressive, powerful, community, libraries, everything there, compilers. So maybe we can just use that and be done with it. That will save a lot of time. So what do, does that mean? How, how could we even use Haskell to, to write smart contracts? And, to explain that, I have just want to go through an example. So what, what does it take to write a smart contract? Let's take a very simple example. Simple crowdfunder, like Kickstarter on a blockchain, right? Somebody proposes a project, other people may fund that project. If by a certain time the funds are good enough, then a project is funded, otherwise, no. So there's a payment deadline. By that time, the project has to be funded. We have uh, a funding goal. If it's reached, then the campaign owner gets those funds. If it's not reached, then everybody can get their funds back. And if the campaign owner runs away, everybody can get their funds back as well, their, whatever they contributed. So a very simple contract. Now, if you want to do this in Solidity for the Ethereum blockchain, then you're going to write some Solidity. Well, you also have to write some JavaScript. Actually, you have to write quite a bit more JavaScript than Solidity, usually. And the two work together in a weird way. There's a library, it's called um, Web3.js, and it communicates via a socket uh, with a local node of the blockchain running on your computer. It's quite involved. And so, which means that actually when you write these contracts, you're writing at two levels. It's really a two-level programming environment. That's what we call this in, in programming language theory, or a staged programming model. 
And we use two different languages for these two stages, and we connect them in a quite ad hoc way. So what this means is it's actually quite um, inconvenient. You sometimes want to move code from Solidity to JavaScript. You have to rewrite it because different language. It's also quite complex because you have to use different languages. You have to this network connection with which the two components of your system talk to each other. And it's quite fragile because if you change the Solidity code, you add one more argument to a function. Um, well, you may forget to change the JavaScript and it just won't work. Um, there's no consistency check. So we thought, hmm, maybe we can do better than that with Haskell. So let's, what are we going to do with the off-chain code? We're going to use Haskell, right? And on-chain code? Well, let's also use Haskell. Well, we are using a subset of it uh, for certain reasons, which we call Plutus TX. But using Haskell for both, and then um, using metaprogramming, Haskell's existing metaprogramming system, to connect these two levels, we get an integrated system. And that's a lot nicer, because now suddenly you only have one programming language. You have the same data type definitions, the same helper functions, which you can share between the two programs. If you have to move code between off-chain and on-chain, well, you cut, copy, paste it, or just call the function from a different place. It's one program, right? A lot easier. It's also compact one program, and it's less fragile. It's more robust, because if I change my on-chain code, I add another argument, the type signature changes, and type checker will tell me if I forget to change the corresponding things in the off-chain code. So, better static checking. Now, how does that look like? So, let's just keep with this example and just the function which I use if I want to contribute to a campaign. So, this is a function, gets a campaign as a first argument, how much money I want to pay into this campaign, a second argument, and it runs in a monad, which we don't have to think about in any more detail. Well, we check that it's a positive value, and then we have to think about this refunding bit, right? So, if I pay this money into the campaign, and the campaign is not successful, I want to get the money back. So, what does that mean, I? Remember what I said about who belo what belongs to somebody in this UTXO model? It means I can spend those funds. So, these funds which I paid out need to be made spendable by me again. And that's what we use cryptographic keys, public key encryption for. Hence, I get my public key, which is basically where the funds are paid back to. And then, I create a transaction using a script. We'll see the script in a moment. So this is contribution script function. And um, we'll, I'll explain that in a second. Then for the value, which is in this transaction, locked in this output, well, that's what we pay into the campaign. And my public key, we wrap into the data script component, the, one of the components of the extended UTXO model. Um, so this is the additional information which the contract has to decide who gets to uh, get those funds again. All right, and then the final thing we have to do is to register an event handler, if you like, that fires when either the campaign is successful or it's not successful and we want to get our refund back, and then that callback, this event handler, submits a transaction to actually get the funds back again. Okay, so what about, this is all off-chain code, right? So now what about the on-chain code? Well, still Haskell, but now we are um, using some template Haskell, and there's some blurb around that, which has to do with the, our specific library. So we use template Haskell to put the on-chain code into as the meta program, in, uh, object program into this meta programming system. And it's just a function. So, for those who don't know Haskell, this is lambda in Haskell. So, we get the campaign, um, what's going to happen, refund or campaign is successful. And TX is the transaction which we're validating, which tries to spend those funds. So, first thing we do, we pattern match on the transaction and we get some information out of it about the transaction we are about to validate. And then there are actually really only two cases. Either the, the um, input 
the red arc, which wants to spend my contribution to the campaign, is one which I submit myself in order to get a refund. If that's the case, then few conditions have to be met for this connection to be allowed. First one, the deadline for the campaign owner to get the funds has to have passed. So that person has run away or wasn't successful. Then we have to see that this transaction actually spends the funds to myself and I must have signed this transaction. So it's really coming from me. We check the signature. If all these three things are fulfilled, well, I get my refund. If the campaign owner has submitted a spending transaction, wants to collect everything from everybody, then there are some other conditions. Well, the campaign deadline must have passed, the time by which everybody must have paid, and it must be before the deadline where the campaign owner has to collect all the funds. And the funding goal, so all the sum of all inputs to the campaign, everything is paid into this campaign, has to be more than the funding goal of the uh, campaign goal. And again, the transaction has to be signed by the right person, namely by the owner of the campaign, so nobody else can get the campaign funds. These are the only two situations in which those funds can be spent, and so it's really a matter of a few billion checks to say true or false. That's all the code you need for this. And it's purely functional, so pure function. All right, so this is the kind of code we write, and then if we look at this in the overall system, how, how is this used on the chain? Well, we have this whole prog Haskell program with on-chain, off-chain code. We run it through our compiler, which is based on GLC, the Glasgow Haskell compiler, and it generates off-chain code, which embeds inside all the required on-chain code, which is the blue bit of the code, compiled different to this Plutus Core Intermediate Language, the system F Omega variant. And then when in my interface to the campaign, to the crowdfunding campaign, uh, I click on, I want to contribute 50 ADA, then that off-chain code runs the code we've just discussed, submits a transaction which it created here, <laughs> and that transaction uses the, the code in the lower half, the compiled version, which is the Plutus core hanging off this thing and locking those, uh, those funds. And then the, the, the circle is closed by the wallets of uh, a user. They observe the blockchain for events. So certain events like this transaction was confirmed or the campaign was successful and so on are observed by the wallet and fed back into the off-chain code, which then can submit new transactions, which lead to events, and you can imagine how that goes on. That's the overall system architecture. Now, <clears throat> we have a, a compiler for this. At the moment, Plutus platform isn't integrated into the Cardano main chain yet, um, for reasons which have to do with the development of this blockchain. Um, we expect this to happen early next year. But people, we also want to already play with these things, actually write contracts. So what we've got instead, we have something which we call Plutus Playgrounds, which is a web environment where you can write your Plutus code and you can um, compile it, test it. Um, it runs on something we call the mock chain, which is a functional simulation of the Cardano blockchain. And um, so you can run your, define a few wallets, what actions do they do, and run the contract and see what other outputs, who gets which funds, what information is on the chain, all that, what you need to develop these contracts. We have some extensions. You can define user-defined tokens of all kinds of various sorts. And um, this thing is online accessible. If you're interested to it, just go to this address and play with it. There are example programs, a tutorial, APIs, and everything. Thank you very much for your attention.